I'm Dr. Steve Claypool, and I'm going to review the medical evidence on carbohydrates. This is a big topic. I reviewed about 100 scientific articles, so there are a lot of calories in this talk. For this reason, I've broken it down into several videos, starting with this overview. Along with fats and protein, carbohydrates are one of the three main macronutrients that the body uses for fuel. Meep, meep. Carbs are simple in structure, being composed of just carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, or CHO. I call them CHOs. The smallest carb molecules are sugars, for example, glucose and fructose. All carbohydrates that the body uses as fuel are first broken down and converted to glucose, which is the blood sugar that circulates in our bloodstream to provide fuel. So fructose is converted to glucose. Sucrose, which is table sugar, is simply glucose and fructose bound together. It's the white granular sugar we cook with, unless it has molasses added to it, then we call it brown sugar. When digested, the sucrose is split into the glucose and fructose molecules, and the fructose is converted to glucose. Lactose is the sugar found in milk. It is composed of the sugars galactose and glucose bound together. Lactose is digested to glucose. Starch is the most common carb in our diet. It is a larger CHO composed of a bunch of glucose molecules bound together. Starch molecules can be very long, with many, many glucose molecules attached in a chain. Like all the other digestible carbs, starch is broken down into glucose. The difference between sugars and starch is that sugars are smaller and our taste buds identify them as sweet. But they're all CHOs and they're all converted to glucose. Fiber is a third category of carbs. It differs from the other carbs in the fact that the CHO molecules are assembled in a way that the human body cannot digest. Other organisms, for example cows and bacteria, can break fiber down into glucose units and burn these carbs as fuel, but humans can't. Since we can't digest fiber, we just poop it out. There are different classifications of fiber. Some can be dissolved in water, that is, they're soluble, and some are insoluble in water. For the most part, these differences don't matter very much for humans nutritionally, except that some fibers help more with pooping, and others can lower cholesterol. For example, the fiber in oats and barley. Although our body can burn fats and protein too, some cells, for example brain and blood cells, can only burn glucose. These cells must have a constant supply of glucose. This is why people become unconscious and can die if they overdose on insulin and their blood sugar drops too low. But don't worry, our body is good at regulating blood sugar. When the blood sugar starts to go too high, the pancreas releases insulin, which lowers the blood sugar by allowing cells to remove it from the blood. This also increases storage of the sugar. On the other hand, if blood sugar starts to drop, the pancreas releases glucagon, which causes the liver to release glucose into the bloodstream. Your body uses these mechanisms to keep the blood sugar level fairly constant. People erroneously think of foods as belonging to strict categories. For example, they often define a food as a protein or a carb. Most of the foods we eat contain a mixture of the macronutrients protein, fat, and carbohydrate. Few foods have only one macronutrient. For example, grains like wheat, oats, and quinoa have almost one-third of their calories from protein and fats. These ratios are similar to milk and beans, foods that most people identify as proteins. Many people don't realize that milk and beans have more than half of their calories from carbs. Even potatoes and rice, two of the most carb-intensive foods, have some protein. And believe it or not, these ratios compare favorably to broccoli. Did you know broccoli has this much protein as a percentage of its calories? Of course, you have to eat a wheelbarrow of it to get enough calories because it's a low-calorie food, but my point is that it's a mistake to so strongly classify foods as just a protein or a carb. Nevertheless, I'm forced to use this classification system to review the literature because many studies have used the same classification. When I'm done, though, I'm going to return to evaluating whole foods, not just macronutrient categories of foods. Some foods with carbs raise the blood sugar very rapidly because they are converted to glucose quickly and absorbed quickly. These carbs stress the insulin system. When large amounts of insulin must be released rapidly to combat rapid rises in blood sugar, it can result in high triglycerides, elevated blood pressure, and eventually insulin resistance and diabetes. And possibly obesity too. Rapid rise in blood sugar results in rapid insulin secretion, rapid storage of the glucose, and rapid correction of blood sugar. The blood sugar may actually end up lower than before eating. This may promote consumption of more food, weight gain, and obesity. 
Some carbs are digested slowly and their glucose just eases into the bloodstream without a rapid rise in blood sugar so they don't stress the insulin system. Slowly digestible carbs do not lead to elevated triglycerides, elevated blood pressure, diabetes, or obesity. Since their glucose is not quickly stored, it stays around in the bloodstream and doesn't promote hunger and increased calorie consumption. So how quickly a food raises your blood sugar is important. It can be measured by the glycemic index. The glycemic index is a relative ranking of foods according to how they affect blood glucose levels. Foods are compared to glucose, which has a value of 100. Glycemic index scores of 55 or less are considered to be low, which is desirable. Carbohydrates with a low glycemic index are more slowly digested, absorbed, and metabolized and cause a lower and slower rise in blood glucose and therefore less stress to the insulin system. Scores above 70 are high. White bread falls into the high range just above 70. White rice is even higher. Sugar has a glycemic index of 60. That may seem surprising, but remember that sugar, which is sucrose, is composed of a glucose molecule and a fructose molecule that must be digested. The fructose component must then be converted to glucose, which is a more involved process, whereas starches are just long chains of glucose molecules, so they're easy to digest. Potatoes, a very high starch food, are one of the only foods that can have a score higher than 100. Remember that glucose itself, which requires no digestion, has a score of 100. We don't eat glucose, it's not part of our diet, but it is the reference range for this test. Yes, potatoes can turn into glucose in the bloodstream more rapidly than glucose can be digested. Whole grains, like whole wheat bread and oats, have a much lower glycemic index. After I made the fruit video, many people questioned that fruit could be good for you because it has sugar. How can fruit be as good for you as vegetables? But fruits have a low glycemic index right alongside common vegetables. They taste sweet, but they don't stress the insulin system and they don't raise the blood sugar. And they seem to prevent, not induce, diabetes. The sugar in fruit is fructose and fructose in raw form has a low glycemic index. Unfortunately, when produced as a highly concentrated syrup, it becomes a high glycemic index food. How foods are processed, prepared, and cooked influences how rapidly they're absorbed as glucose in the blood. Let's compare white bread and pasta. Both are made from white flour, yet bread has a much higher glycemic index. The glycemic index of pasta will vary based on how it's cooked. When it's served al dente, pastas have a low glycemic index but the index is higher when noodles are overcooked and served mushy. And to complicate things, not all people digest carbs at the same rate. Skinny, aerobically fit people tend to digest carbs more slowly and don't stress their insulin systems as much. So high glycemic index carbs may not be as unhealthy for them. I'll get into that data later. Milk products have a low glycemic index, down here with fruits, and beans and nuts have a very low glycemic index. One of the criticisms of glycemic index is that it doesn't take into account the amount of food we eat. A butterscotch candy may have a fairly high glycemic index, but it doesn't contribute that much to raising your blood sugar because a candy is so small. We just don't eat a lot of them compared to other foods like bread. So there is an alternate measure called glycemic load. It calculates the total impact on blood sugar accounting for both glycemic index and serving size. So it puts more emphasis on the foods that have large servings. Instead of a scale from zero to 100, it has a scale from zero to about 30. With a glycemic load scale, foods less than 10 are healthy, greater than 20, unhealthy. Rice, potatoes, sweet potatoes, and corn have a very high glycemic load, and so do corn-based grain products. Other grains have lower glycemic load, including white bread, and 100% whole grain bread and whole grain cereals have a much lower glycemic load. Cereals vary considerably from low to medium, as do granola bars. Beans all have low or extremely low glycemic loads. Ditto for nuts. And fruit is very low too. Apples, peaches, pears, oranges, watermelon are right alongside peas and carrots and milk, despite their sugar content. Both glycemic index and glycemic load are valid measures of food healthiness, and they tend to yield the same information. I think it's easiest to remember these foods if I list them in buckets, and if I lump both glycemic index and glycemic load together. 
Potatoes and rice are very high. Corn and corn-based products are high, as is white bread and sweet potatoes. Bad carbs, bad carbs. <laughs> Quinoa, oatmeal, brown rice, some granola bars, yogurt, some cold cereals, and pasta are medium. Whole wheat bread, whole wheat pasta, rye, and whole grain cold cereals are low, along with fruits, vegetables, and beans. Good carbs. <coughs> Try to remember the basics of this information because it cannot be found on food labels we use in the United States. In some countries, like Australia, they label glycemic index information. Their labels actually indicate if a food has a low glycemic index. But in the U.S., we're more worried about trivial food minutia than information that impacts health. In my next video, I'll review why glycemic index is important.